Welcome back, George. In this episode, what we will really get down to some detail is to understand the underlying reasons why some of the business models that you described in the previous episode were able to scale. While I was listening to what you described earlier, I understood that partnerships were really key to the whole process. How important were partnerships? Thanks, Sanjay. Great to be back. Partnerships are indeed really important to our work in the digital utilities team, but I'm also personally very passionate about them because I think successful innovation ecosystems require partnerships. And although we often focus on the success story of the individual entrepreneur, there are actually so many partnerships which make innovation ecosystems possible and are able for them to also be inclusive. In the GSMA Digital Utilities Program, we think that digital solutions can really unlock business models with the capacity of extending service provision to low-income populations, particularly in urban areas. However, these solutions require very strong partnerships between the public and the private sector, as well as mobile operators and technology providers. So while innovators bring new approaches and solutions, mobile operators provide the digital platforms and underlying connectivity infrastructure to reach and communicate with customers while municipalities and utilities obviously have crucial service mandates to fulfill that private sector innovators can plug into. When I think about our program's work, specifically one of the key objectives of the program is to help innovators build partnerships with mobile operators. We've facilitated 48 of such partnerships during our program history, but this has also become something that's been an important funding criteria for us when sort of evaluating different pitches for our GSMA Innovation Fund applications so that startups and innovators that have partnerships with mobile operators or public sector entities in place or are thinking about putting them in place are more likely to get funded. Right. You know, it is partnerships are a question that you ask. It's a criteria for selection of the grant. But in some cases, I remember it is mandatory for the startup to have a partnership to even apply. Yes. So in the past, for some of our market engagement grants, so those were the grants which were for some more established solutions to replicate their solution or scale it in a different market. In those instances, it was quite key to have a partnership with a mobile operator in place already. It was a huge advantage if an innovator had such a partnership in place. Obviously, we do take into account also that uh, the partnership landscape varies quite a bit across the different sectors we work on. So um, there are a lot of examples of off-grid solar companies partnering with mobile operators, but there aren't as many examples uh, of sanitation service providers partnering with mobile operators. So obviously, we, we're quite flexible as well and take those uh, nuances into account. Right. And that's a great point. Let's just look at it from both points of view. What does a startup benefit from? Obviously, it's the startup benefits from the MNO scale. Can you elaborate on this a little bit more? Absolutely. I think that MNO partnerships can be really key for startups, specifically in low and middle income countries, because in low and middle income countries, mobile operators differentiate themselves because they have a large customer base. They have brand recognition and trust, which reaches even a more informal or rural areas. They have a wide sales and distribution network through the Asian network. They have a mobile money infrastructure that's being used by more and more uh, people as the state of the industry report uh, that our mobile money team here showcases. And in some cases, they even have the capacity to invest. So startups aiming to increase their recognition, but also increase their reach can definitely gain from partnering with mobile operators. And that's great. But what about the other way around? How do mobile operators, the larger organizations stand to benefit? Yeah, thanks, Sandra. Most people understand that, you know, startups have something to gain from partnering with mobile operators, but the other side isn't always properly understood. So in the case of mobile operators, I think the obvious advantage for mobile operators would be driving their mobile money business and creating more use cases for mobile money by integrating with different startups whose business models are built around digital payment use cases. An example of that is Pay As You Go Solar. In our past research, we've showcased that PayGo Solar customers are more likely to use mobile money, not just for solar payments, but also for other use cases. 
We've also showcased that partnerships with startups can be key for mobile operators to reach new customer segments. So a significant proportion of if users of the CityTab service in Niger that we supported in collaboration with Orange, prepaid smart metering service in the water sector, 20% of CityTab's customer base, around 20% were new mobile money users. So mobile operator like Orange being able to increase its customer base among, among the urban poor in this case. But obviously this applies to other customer segments like people living in rural areas as well as exemplified by a project by a partnership we supported in Ghana between MTN and Safe Water Network, where Safe Water Network was able to extend the usage of mobile service within a new customer base that MTN hasn't previously uh, been able to engage in, in rural Ghana. New revenue streams and increased and better customer relationships are other reasons for why MNOs uh, might want to invest in these kinds of partnerships because oftentimes having a lot of different use cases associated with an MNO also means that customer stickiness increases. So customers are less likely to switch to another mobile operator because mobile services are not just associated with making phone calls, but now they're also associated with other vital use cases like energy service delivery, for instance. So increasing customer stickiness is another key reason for why mobile operators would want to be collaborating with startups. And then overall, obviously, there in the macro sense, there are a lot of ways in which mobile operators tend to benefit from an increasing digital economy, given that they're heavily invested in that across many low and middle income countries. So well articulated, increasing revenues from an individual customer, tapping into new customers, increasing stickiness of customers. These are three obviously important things that a large organization will look at. But I'm just curious about the process. Did the large organizations go ahead and do the search of innovative organizations on their own, or did the innovative organizations come to them with offers, or in some ways, maybe GSMA brokered the relationship? Just give us an insight into what really happened. That's a great question. So there's no linear pathway for such partnerships. So they do emerge in different ways, but different pathways I can point to to kind of illustrate how it works. In many cases, startups in sectors which don't have, as I mentioned before, a very sort of established partnership landscape, like let's say the off-grid solar sectors, they are, I think, enabling organizations and funders like our program are uniquely positioned to help startups, for instance, working in sectors like waste management, water, and sanitation to help them kind of articulate their value proposition to mobile operators on the one hand, but then also to help mobile operators understand how they could potentially benefit from partnering with that organization. So our work in the digital utilities team is really to kind of create a haves and needs framework almost between the MNO and the startup and then to facilitate based on those synergies. And we then coach and mentor startups on how they should approach with mobile operators, also consistently engaging our mobile operator stakeholders about the opportunities that we see specifically across utility sectors. What can also be beneficial is, you know, being able to highlight how much of a customer base you reach as a startup. For instance, when Phoenix was still operating in Uganda, it was actually one of the top three merchant bill payment accounts for MTN uh, Uganda in the entire country. So that can just highlight the, the sheer scale of some of these payment use cases. Uh, yeah, practically speaking, uh, lots of partnerships in, are forged by our team, but a lot of mobile operators are also proactively uh, seeking out partnerships. For instance, we've recently hosted a, a workshop in Lagos featuring a lot of waste management and transport uh, startups um, operating in, in Lagos and the chief digital officer of MTN joined that uh, workshop as well and talked a lot about how MTN sees it as critical uh, to support the startup ecosystem in Nigeria. The growth of that ecosystem also has a lot of important co-benefits for MTN. It was really interesting to see um, how proactive MTN Nigeria was with regards to, you know, engaging the startups down the line and looking at partnership opportunities with them as well. So partnerships form in 
multiple ways. And in some ways, I'm hearing you speak, you, know, you could play the role of an information broker. Give us a little bit of insight into what happens after these partnerships. You know, for example, do the larger organizations end up making an investment in the innovative organizations or acquiring them? Have you seen examples of that? Yeah, so that's been quite interesting for us, seeing how some of these partnerships evolve, but also some mobile operators even make investment decisions, taking stakes in some startups. So in the off-grid solar sector, obviously there's been a lot of interest by mobile operators, but also by other large corporates. So I guess I'd point to two different approaches there. So one can see um, Orange um, through its Orange Energy d- Division take a quite mobile operator-led approach to off-grid solar, where Orange Energy actually sells a solar kit itself. And then another approach of other large conglomerates, such as Engie, obviously acquiring our former grantees Phoenix and Mobisol under the banner NG Energy Access. NG is a large-scale energy provider, so it's really interesting to see them taking an interest in this last mile off-grid solar piece as well. In the clean cooking sector, actually, we've seen in Copagas, which developed a pay-as-you-go LPG smart metering solution in Tanzania, being acquired by a consortium called Circle Gas, uh, which is operating in both Kenya and Tanzania. And Circle Gas' main investor is actually Safaricom. So Safaricom saw a strategic interest in this LPG smart metering technology for clean cooking, as obviously that can drive more uh, mobile money use cases in Kenya and beyond. And it's really interesting to see a mobile operator kind of making that investment uh, from a strategic uh, perspective. So those are some of the examples we've seen. We've also seen interest by mobile operators in some of the other sectors we're starting to work on like mobility no sort of acquisitions there yet but it's good to see um, sort of this interest in the off-grid solar sector and also in the clean cooking sector there are, though there are always trade-offs between a large organization partnering with a startup versus you know a large organization aiming to deliver the same services as a startup in the same innovative way Right. And you mentioned Copa Gas exam in the last podcast, and you actually characterized it as the first private equity investment that has happened in, overall in the clean energy access space, which, of course, is very important. I'm going to take you up on the offer of helping us understand Orange's strategy, which seems to be like striking out and doing these things on its own. Yeah, it's really interesting. For regards to Orange Energy, um, because there are some advantages and some disadvantages uh, we would, with regards to you know, operator-led models on, in off-grid solar. Um, first of all, Orange um, has an entire sort of energy division. It has the ability to think in quite large-scale terms since it's operating across so many different African countries. And it's not only engaged in off-grid solar, but also in other energy project and recently was granted a license in Mali to become an energy service provider, not just in the the off-grid solar space. The the advantage it has, as I mentioned, is that it can think at quite a large scale and that can enable the quick replication of successful business models. So an example of that um, is the partnership with Escotel, which is a, a company which was formed in partnership between Northfund and Sajimcom and it provides clean energy to telecom towers in Africa. Obviously, half of the telecom towers in Africa are currently bad grid or off grid, according to our uh, GSMA Climate Tech program. And Orange was able to strike a partnership with this company, Escotel, to focus on 900 telecom towers in Sierra Leone, Congo, and Liberia, and to help them being electrified by renewable energy. And obviously, this model is quite interesting because There's also a potential of revival of what we call the ABC model, the anchor-based client model, where telecom tower is powered by a mini-grid. The telecom tower sort of serves as the anchor client of that mini-grid, but that mini-grid then also serves the surrounding settlement or community. So it'd be really interesting to see whether there'll be more growth of this model as uh, there's obviously more pressure on mobile operators such as Orange to green Uh, their footprint and make sure that their telecom tower infrastructure is powered by clean energy. On the flip side, one has to ask whether 
the strategy of Orange selling solar home systems directly to customers in countries is preferable to, you know, Orange partnering with Pazigo solar providers that then sell the solar kits to customers themselves. Because it's important to say that being a mobile operator is very different from being a solar home system provider and selling mobile money units is very different from selling solar home system kits. So Orange obviously pursues those dual strategy. It still partners with other solar home system providers and sells their own, but it'd be interesting to think about relative success of both models. Sekou Dramé, the CEO of Sonatel, gave an interview in Jeune Afrique, I think in March this year, stating that Orange Energy had sold 31,000 solar kits in Mali, Senegal, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Guinea-Bissau by, as of the end of 2021, suggesting that there's still a lot of scope for this model to scale and that and there's a lot of questions about whether that model actually has more potential than mobile operators simply being sort of effective partners to pay go solar providers that really specialize on that. Right. And on that line of thought, have the mobile operators made strategic investments in some of these solar pairs you go companies or many good companies for that matter? The investment activity of mobile operators in off-grid solar has been a bit more uh, limited, uh, specifically in the SHS space. There have been a couple of joint ventures on the mini-grid side, mostly around this ABC model that I mentioned, because obviously there are natural synergies between the the mini-grid provider and the telco company when it comes to that model specifically. And for example, in 2018, We've supported a project, Electricité de Madagascar, where the actually the parent company of the energy provider and the telco company were quite, there are a lot of synergies and they created this joint venture called WeLight to further explore synergies between uh, telco electrification and rural electrification. So in that space, we see some um, investment activity. Right. Just to help our audience who may have forgotten what ABC model is it is basically powering up the telecom tower itself, that is the anchor base load, and then using any excess energy for local community purposes. One of the things, George, you alluded to, but we did not go into detail, is the public partnerships, the government relationships with the startups. That would be of interest as well, right? Absolutely. And this is something I think that has become a more of a core focus of our program as we've increasingly focused on the topic of uh, supporting urban resilience in low and middle income countries by enabling access to essential utility services. We see a lot of utility service providers and municipalities in low and middle income countries attempting to cope with the challenges of rapid urbanization, uh, climate change and inequality. And a lot of them are struggling to provide affordable and reliable services to low income urban populations. That's exemplified, for instance, in Bangladesh, where Dhaka Wasa, the utility serving Dhaka, one of the largest, obviously, cities in the world, is struggling to reach informal settlements. And what this has caused is a proliferation of informal tanker, uh, water tanker cartels that are charging very high fees for water that's not even safely managed in informal areas. So poor people, which are already facing higher costs due to many reasons, now also have to spend a lot of time and money by lining up and then having to pay for expensive water services. So in order to respond to that challenge, Dakawasa partnered with Drinkwell, a water ATM provider, to provide regulated drinking water from uh, safely managed drinking water to informal settlements. And that had important uh, benefits for Dhaka Wasa as well, beyond obviously ensuring that the utility now reaches low income segment. It also expanded, it also improved its brand perception and reduced water leakage overall. And as a utilities team, we see a lot of uh, potential in these uh, public private partnerships between private sector innovators and public service providers or municipalities. Other examples include our work with WonderKid and City Tabs that I've alluded to in, in the previous episode. And something that we've also become quite interested in is um, how these partnerships can not only help the public sector provide services more effectively, but also generate important data 
on customer segments that they previously didn't engage with a lot and then also help plan for future uh, interventions and, uh, and reforms to service delivery that can then allow for more inclusive services. On the issue of data, data can also help allocation of subsidies, or I should say targeted allocation of subsidies. And I know that this is happening in a few countries as well, especially in energy. Obviously, in the off-grid solar space, we're really interested in in terms of how the sector has evolved. And we remember when we initially funded the sector, there were a few people only which openly sort of discussed uh, the role that subsidies could potentially play in the sector. And it used to be a bit more of a taboo uh, word, but obviously, given the history of, of electrification across the globe, subsidies have always played a very important role in extending energy access. If you look at the history of electrification of uh, Western or Asian countries as well. So it's, it's interesting that by leveraging digital innovation, some countries like Togo or Rwanda have been sort of experimenting with targeting end user subsidies, you know, through mobile payments, uh, specifically Togo through the CISO program. And that's a really interesting way of leveraging digital innovation to extend solar home systems to customers who would otherwise not even be able to afford sort of the most basic solar home system payment plan. Obviously, these subsidies need to be sort of targeted and evaluated in a systematic way, but they definitely are very interesting dynamic, particularly with regards to countries which still face huge energy access rates in the context of entrenched poverty. And another country that comes into mind in that context is the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is potentially seeking to replicate some of the achievements in Togo through the CISO program through its own end-user subsidy program called uh, FOMWINDA. On the use of data, continuing on that topic, I know that you have put out a publication and public-private partnerships around the use of big data in several countries, at least two of them in Asia. Yes, recently published a report on the role of innovative data for urban planning. And in that report, we wanted to look at the challenge of data scarcity that a lot of municipalities face, specifically when it comes to the expansion of the city as it is so rapidly evolving, but then also when it comes to informal settlements specifically, which hosts up to 60% of the urban population in least developed countries. And we looked specifically at the role that innovative data sources such as mobile uh, operator data, remote sensing data, utility services data, and other digital services data can play urban planning and service provision use cases. In the report, we found a lot of interesting examples, um, as you mentioned, for the utilization of innovative data sources. So one of the case studies we looked at was a case study collaboration between EPS, the statistical department in Indonesia, and a telecom cell, one of the major telco operators in the country. And EPS, in this case, used telco data in order to understand how the metropolitan boundaries of the city of Bandung have evolved over time. As cities rapidly expand, their metropolitan boundaries also emerged and they use call detailed records to create origin and destination matrices of commuters who would sort of come to work in the city. And that helped the statistical department create a new model of where metropolitan boundaries are now delineated. It might seem like a quite specific use case, but it actually has quite important implications as metropolitan boundaries have a lot of important implications for who's responsible for service delivery in which area and you know how much revenue a certain municipality is supposed to receive in order to deliver those services effectively. And previously, BPS had also been using telecom data to understand the impact of tourist events on public transport, so how a sort of surge rider demand is likely to influence the flow of traffic and routes throughout the city. And it's really interesting because obviously conducting surveys is really expensive for a lot of statistical offices in low and middle income countries. And while conducting surveys will never become irrelevant, they are often important in order to even check whether the insights from innovative data sources such as telco data are valid, but the cost can be decreased tremendously if for certain use cases one can rely on these innovative data sets um, such as mobile operator data. We also looked at a couple of other use cases such as 
an organization called Gather, creating this sanitation data hub in Antananarivo by kind of bringing together data sets, public and private service providers, as well as NGOs. Um, allow, and, and that allowed it to, for instance, create a model to understand how flooding would impact the city's sanitation infrastructure over time. And obviously understanding that Madagascar is one of the countries facing huge uh, climate adaptation challenges, it's really interesting to see the role that data can play to increase uh, resilience. We've also looked at a, a use case in the Philippines uh, where a government entity collaborated with ride hailing companies in the open street map in order, in order to improve transport planning. But overall, uh, these use cases are all really interesting. Uh, but what we try to do in the report is really highlight uh, not only the, the things that these partnerships were able to achieve, but what we really wanted to highlight is the process of partnership formation, how uh, partnerships are uh, taken from pilot to scale, and what ultimately underpins the sustainability of these partnerships, but also obviously what limitations um, some of these partnerships might face. In our report, we, we provide a broad overview that kind of looks at the evolution of those partnerships as well. The process of partnership creation is really important, and we are actually in this episode trying to talk a little bit about it. I think we've understood some of the elements of how organizations benefit, how organizations strike partnerships, but it's also important to think about the other thing. Partnerships are not easy, right? Especially the startup and the larger private organization, the public organization, they all have very different cultures and culture eats strategy for breakfast, as once Peter Drucker said. From that point of view, can you reflect on some of the lessons? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think one has to be realistic about the fact that, as you mentioned, partnerships are hard. There are a lot of potential barriers facing success of partnerships, specifically when it comes to data. But I think some of these points apply to startup public sector partnerships in general. So I think when it comes to the innovator public sector interface, I think one has to take into account that the timelines the language, but also the priorities of private sector innovators can differ quite substantially from those in the public sector. So it's important to understand that and to take that into account. It's also important to, from the onset, think about the, the business models and revenue streams that are going to underpin partnerships over the long term. And it's also important if, from a private sector innovator perspective to adapt and hedge against potential risks. So for instance, state-owned utilities as a partner can be quite challenging when it comes to revenue collection. So if there's a revenue agreement between a private sector innovator and the utility, so how can the private sector innovator insulate themselves against the risk that a utility will pay very irregularly? Does that mean it has to rely on multiple different revenue streams? Does it have to work with a range of different utilities so risks are diversified? So those are some of the questions one can ask themselves. Or, you know, does there need to be another financing partner that can take on some of the risk? So those are some of the considerations. But also when it comes to the question of partnerships involving data specifically, I think it's really important to take you know, local context and local political economies uh, into account. Who are the key stakeholders and what are their incentives? Then I think it's also important to take into account the digital capacity of the public sector. It's really important to understand what that capacity looks like, to understand what use cases are possible and relevant. Aligning, you know, different stakeholders with sometimes competing priorities is really tough, but important work here as well. And then, as I mentioned, the identification of business models that can sort of finance these, these partnerships in the long term. When it comes to data, it's also really data partnerships. It's also really important to co-create with the public sector from the onset, because oftentimes private sector innovators or data scientists create these very fancy data models or data analyses, but they often aren't necessarily uh, translated into any, uh, to have any policy impact. And it's often because this co-creation was lacking from the onset. So it's really important to understand what does the public sector actually need? Do they need a report, an app, a decision-making support mechanism? How should the final analysis actually 
be presented and how will it be integrated into an ongoing policy making process. So those are some of the things that one has to take into account, but important to say that there's no silver bullet to successful partnerships, I think require ongoing stakeholder engagement and aligning incentives uh, and stakeholders. And obviously we at the GSMA Digital Utilities Program are really excited to be able to support both private sector innovators and the public sector to kind of drive more of these partnerships forward. Absolutely right. There is no silver bullet. But one thing I wanted to just understand a little bit more, and you touched upon this, is the risks that private sector entrepreneurs face. In partnering, you elaborated on the risks with public sector organizations, but there are very big risks in operating with private sector large organizations as well. Typically, sometimes uh, the private sector organization can fall between the cracks of different departments or organizational priorities change. Is there some lessons that you have from there? Yes, absolutely. It definitely, there can be some risks. And I think it's oftentimes the case that large organizations tend to be a bit more bureaucratic. In some instances, don't always uh, tend to be that responsive to the needs of startups. So if as a startup kind of partnering with a mobile operator, for example, it's really important to um, take into account their ways of working and not have set unrealistic expectations, which would expect you to receive an answer from a mobile operator, maybe as quickly as you would from a fellow startup partner. Those kinds of different timelines, uh, different cultures of working are really important to take into account. With that, we come to the end of the podcast, and maybe I'll ask you to summarize your thoughts to the three audiences that you speak to, to your core mobile audience, to the public utilities, and to innovative organizations. You have to sort of summarize your thoughts in very difficult in three sentences. What do you do? So to the mobile operator audience slash those uh, broader digital ecosystem, I think it's really important to stress that it makes business sense to invest and try to reach those at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, so low-income po- populations specifically. We've showcased that throughout our work in the digital utilities program, and I think it would be really important for mobile operators to continue to see value in partnering with startups that deliver essential services, not just because it makes business sense, but also because it's critical for countries to achieve their national uh, development objectives and for mobile operators to not just be interested in short-term shareholder value maximization, but also long-term stakeholder value uh, creation. And I think that's really key. And if you look at the role of the mobile industry on the African continent specifically, and look at the role of mobile money, this way of embracing innovative service delivery models that, that have the capacity to reach underserved communities is kind of in the DNA of the evolution of the industry for, because mobile money, for instance, quite exemplary. It's an innovation that wanted to find a response to, to so many people being excluded from formal banking services. And on this note, I can only recommend folks to read the book by Ifosa Yomo, uh, Clayton Christian's Katie Dillian on market creating innovations because they really illustrate how uh, being able to provide services to people in a cheaper way can be really transformational at scale. And pays you go solar, mobile money are examples of services uh, that low-income communities were previously unable to afford, but due to the the potential of digital innovations are now able to afford. So I think these are really interesting uh, frameworks that should continue to guide the actions of mobile operators. When it comes to utility service providers and governments, I think it's really important to take into account that with 90% of urban growth being concentrated in Africa and Asia from now to 2050, urban inequality also remaining quite accentuated and climate change remaining a challenge that faces a lot of cities in low and middle income countries. I think it's really important to embrace uh, innovative service delivery models and really make it a priority to reach low income urban populations, because if not, water shortages, unsanitary conditions, unreliable power provision, pollution, and inadequate waste management could really remain a defining reality for a lot of low-income urban populations living in low- and middle-income countries, and that would be quite detrimental to the economic growth potential of low- and middle-income countries, because cities should be engines of prosperity and social mobility and not poverty traps. And then lastly, with regards to 
innovative organizations and some of the private sector innovators and, and investors we work on, I think it's really critical for uh, innovators to focus on the real challenges people face. I find it quite exciting that we see so much investment going into fintech and that's great, but I, that there's a huge mismatch between you know, where we see a lot of commercial funding in, in venture capital going and where the social returns uh, really are. So you know, it'd be great to build on the success we've seen in fintech and then for other sectors like climate tech, water and sanitation to also receive more attention because matching social returns and private returns, there's a lot of potential to expand on that. It's also important for impact investors and just investors in general, which have the ambition to not just deliver financial returns, but also might have strategic objectives like improving the world, increasing climate resilience to really put their money where their mouth is. We see a lot more financing going to low and middle income countries, but we all know that from a climate financing perspective, you know, a lot of African countries receive way too little with regards to uh, where the needs are. So I think there, the entire investment community, but also donors really, really need to step up and put the, put the money where their mouth is. Lastly, I would just say that when it comes to utility service delivery, private sector innovators and digital innovations can make an important contribution, but they can only achieve so much low and middle income countries can just out entrepreneur themselves out of every challenge that they face. And it's important that, you know, the public sector and government officials, especially also view, um, you know, equitable access to basic services as an absolute political priority. And we've seen in some instances where that has been the case, that usually creates an important momentum and also creates interesting pathways for private sector innovators and uh, mobile operators to plug into an existing public sector agenda, making sure that inclusive service delivery is actually a political priority is actually very critical for, for the sectors we work in as well. Brilliant, John. I found that really inspiring point that you made about cities have to be the engines of prosperity, not the traps of poverty. That, and for that to happen, you know, everybody has to really come together, the public sector, the private sector, the innovative organizations and the larger organizations all have to come together and collaborate. You know, that's kind of the message, you know, the sum up of your inspiring last few words. With that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sanjay. I really appreciate it.